Hi, my name is Kyle Robertson and I'm a mechanical engineer here at the Naval Air Warfare Center Aircraft Division, Patuxent River. And I am in the mobile fab lab parked outside of the Innovation Hub. This is a resource that is available to uh, the employees here on base to be able to design and prototype parts for the Navy. An example of one of those parts is this bracket here. We had a customer come in with an idea to protect some fiber optic cables that were being broken on the back of a rack by people passing by. So this is mounted to that rack and it protects that. He had an idea for this and he came and used our software and this is SolidWorks here that's being shown on the left side and that's the software, the CAD software that was used to create this model from our customer's ideas on how he wanted this part to function. And then once that solid model is made in SolidWorks, it can be imported to the software on the right, which is Cura. And Cura uses that solid model, breaks it into layers as the 3D printer would use to create the part. So we can look at this and pull it in and visually see all the layers that are created for 3D printing. And 3D printing will start at the bottom on this first layer and then as it prints layer by layer the geometry of your part is formed. And this is a software that you can use to get your ideas into a visual representation of, of what it is. So you can show others, you can have it made from there. And then there's many settings that we can use to adjust that for different material properties. So uh, there are additional workstations here that can be used. We've got four workstations that have SOLIDWORKS on them, and they also have other software that can be used for different types of prototyping as well. So let's take a look at a real 3D printer. So as you can see, this is a 3D printer that's creating the part that you saw earlier, layer by layer. It's approximately on the 200th layer of the 390 layers. And how it creates this part is it takes a spool of material similar to what's shown here and this is located on the back of the 3d printer it pulls this material up through this hose into a heated nozzle that then displaces the plastic where it needs to be on the part and then it cools into place to create your solid part these are some examples of some projects that have been printed in the past this is an electronics box. The top and bottom was created in two different prints and then placed together and electronics were mounted inside. This is an example of a radio that was 3D printed in order to check the fitment in various locations without having to have the actual radio on hand. This is an example of a bracket that was placed over an opening to keep people from dropping hardware, screws and bolts into the opening. Uh, a practical example that was used at our facility was when we sign in at the front desk, we did that via an iPad and that needed to be placed on a holder. When we had a stand, we matched the hole pattern. This was mounted to the stand and then we were able to just place this in it. And this was used in the 3D printed Form. And then we also made one for uh, a horizontal orientation as well. Do we have any questions up to this point? How strong are the 3D printed parts? That's a great question. So we have some parameters that we can set in Cura to figure out and determine how strong our parts are going to be. Now there's a trade-off to strength and weight and time. So the more plastic we put into a part, the longer it's going to take to print, the heavier it's going to be, but the stronger it'll be. Now we have a number of shells that we can adjust that will allow us to have more strength in our part. So this is one, two, three, and four, and shell is actually passes of the nozzle around the part to give it a shell, as you can think of like an egg. So this is one pass, two, three, and then four passes. Now that we found creates strength more than what infill does. Now infill has a setting for percentage as well, uh, as far as 5% shown here, 10, 20, 40, 60, 80. You can get to see this is getting pretty solid, but that does not increase strength 
as much as the outer perimeter does. And then there are patterns to consider as well. So a grid, line, cross, it gets fancy. Now, some of these are artistic, not necessarily for design structurally, but there are differences in strength. So grid has uh, a lot of compressive strength, for example. Now, there are also different types of materials you can print with. So there is PLA with what we're printing here that's very inexpensive and easy to print with, but uh, there's also other materials that are much stronger. For an example, uh, high-end companies sell Ultim that has about a quarter of the strength of aluminum, which is about the best that you're gonna get with this type of technology. But with that said, we can still make parts that are pretty strong if they need to be. So, uh, for example, I have a, a leg here that I made out of ABS, that's the same material that Legos uh, are made out of, and I made it pretty strong where I can stand on it. And this is going to be used as one of four to hold up some enclosures and 3D printers in our facility. Any other questions? How big can you print things? That's another great question, and to answer that, I'm going to turn you over to my coworker Russell Gilbert to show you the largest 3D printers we have. Thanks, Kyle. My name is Russell Gilbert, and I'm a mechanical engineer, and I'm going to show you the large format 3D printers that we have here. Uh, the first one is the Fusion F410, and you can see inside is the part that Kyle actually stood on earlier. So you can see how large this is compared to the actual 3D printer. This printer has a print envelope of, it's 14 across, 14 deep, and 12.4 inches tall. If you need to print a really tall part, we have the Raise 3D N2 Plus, and this allows us to print 12 across, 12 deep, and 24 inches tall. This printer also has the capability of using two different nozzles, so you can use two different materials, or you can actually use the same materials, but two different colors. Uh, if you're going to use two different materials, you can use one that is flexible and one that is rigid. Uh, you could use the flexible to wrap around, say, a phone, so if you're going to build a phone case, and then the back panel can be made out of the rigid material, which will make it a lot stronger. The two different colors you can use for a no-go gauge, so one side being red, maybe one side being green, uh, and that allows you to make sure that certain parts can fit inside of different parts and then others cannot fit, so you know if it's the right orientation and placements of those. So this is our Roland MDX40. It's a CNC mill, which is computer numerically controlled. Um, this has a cutting tool that cuts away the material instead of putting material down. So these cutting tools come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Uh, these are three popular ones that we use here. Uh, the first one is a straight cutting tool. So this would be loaded in the machine this way and it would allow you to cut straight holes or uh, long edges on your parts. The second tool is a cabinetry or joint tool, and it's cutting surfaces on those angles there and allows you to fix parts together afterwards. And then the last tool is a countersink tool or a chamfer tool. It actually has a uh, cutting edge here at a 45 degree angle and allows you to make countersinks or a nice beveled edge on the outsides of your parts. Are there any questions on this machine here? What's the difference between milling and 3D printing? That's another great question. Kyle showed you the spool of material that's typically loaded in the additive manufacturing machines. Uh, typically in a CNC mill, you'll load in a material uh, that'll be a solid part. And when you cut that away, it will be left with your part. So you see that this final part is captured within that material and then this outer section will be cut away later. This allows you to have a much stronger part because it's a solid material being cut. 3D printing does layer by layer, so with the part that we showed you earlier, printed in this orientation, um, uh, compared to the CNC mill where it's solid, so the weak points should be somewhere in between these layers, so if I put a little bit of force across this, it should break pretty easily. That, that gusset's holding up pretty well. There we go. So you can see here that uh, in between its layers, uh, it just separated from itself. So that's called um, the, just the layer delamination. So this just split right in between the layers here. And that's typically the weakest point of a 3D print. Um, 
most of the time with these prototypes, we're not looking for strength. So we're just looking for size and overall shape. So that's not a big deal. You could see I took a, quite a bit of force for me to break where this gusset was. Um, with a CNC milled part, you might be a little bit more hard pressed to break that actual piece. So this is the last piece of equipment we have in the Fab Lab. It's an epilogue CO2 laser and it's 50 watts. Uh, you can see it has a very large uh, envelope that it's able to cut in. Uh, it's 28 deep and 40 across. Uh, this has a very precise laser that it uses. So for an example, we use this for etching. Um, we use different powers and speeds and we're able to accomplish a really fine uh, etch on these parts. So if you have to uh, have any indications or name plates being made, uh, this is a great tool for that. Uh, we may also use it uh, in a plywood application just to make a quick template. Uh, something like this may only take 10 to 20 seconds to actually be able to cut this completely out. So compared to the 3D printer taking about three hours, this is a lot faster job. Um, and to compare that with models, uh, we made a airfoil of the F-35. So we cut multiple pieces out of a large sheet and we're able to glue this together. Um, so instead of waiting for this to print on the 3D printer, we put this in the laser uh, and we're able to get this part very quickly. We've also used the laser to make custom rubber gaskets. So if we had parts that required uh, spe specific fittings for different rubber gaskets. We were able to do that as well. Um, so it's very precise uh, compared to our other machines and it's very fast. So this concludes our tour of the Fab Lab. Hal and I would like to thank you for joining us uh, and showing you the awesome tools that we have here. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out.